The dungeons beneath the imperial capital of Kinburg have served as the sanctified burial grounds for the noble lords of the realm since time immemorial. Whenever the syphilitic bodies finally succumbed, whenever the dark deals in devilry and diabolism finally came due, we put them to rest in the crypts beneath the city. They will be buried with their crowns and their gold and the trophies they took from the land. No peasant, no commoners, no one who was not noble-born was given the same consideration, except to sometimes be buried alive to serve the rulers in the great hereafter. When the People's Revolution reached Kinburg, we threw all the nobles into that exact same pit. We filled it with barons stripped of their furs, lords stripped of their jewels, and kings stripped of their heads. We packed their precious mausoleum to the brim and buried them with their lies. But we underestimated their desperation. With his final breath, the emperor Titan King cursed Kinburg and all who lived therein. He called upon the power of the demons and devils he had served during his terrible reign to curse the people's revolution. And so that dark diablery has found its way back into the realm. The dead kings have risen, our crops are blighted, and the revolutionary council has become corrupt. The last act of the revolution falls to you. It is up to you to kill the dead lords and reclaim their wealth. It is up to you to keep the people safe. It is up to you to end the last emperor's death curse and restore the land. For the realm, for the people, for the revolution. Last public address from brother twice betrayed, mother of the people's revolution. So, this is the story of A Torch in the Dark. As you can see, this is probably one of the most thematic introduction to any solo role-playing games. Hello everyone, this is Melvia. Welcome back to my channel. Today I want to talk about a solo role-playing game slash dungeon crawl that is called A Torch in the Dark. But before I start, I want to quickly talk about what, in my opinion, are the three main pillars of a great solo role-playing game. I think a great solo role-playing game has to have a strong theme and an immersive story. Because quite often, that is the first thing that draws the players into the world. Your story has to be believable, because that is where your players will feel like they are living in another time and in another world. The second main player will be the gameplay. The gameplay of any solo role-playing games has to be as exciting, it has to be challenging, and it has to be engaging, because that is where your players will spend most of the time doing. They're not always going to be listening to your stories, but they will be the ones rolling the dice. They will be the one checking out the results. And if that part is not fun, then they will simply go and pursue something more interesting. And the third pillar, in my opinion, will be the narrative freedoms. Any great solo role-playing games needs to provide a great nar narrative freedom to the players. They have to be able to create their own stories, join the docs together to create their own little plots, um, and the best ones will be able to allow them to give them tools to change the world that is in the role-playing games because that is where they feel like they have a say in the, in the world. And the best of the solo role-playing games not only will be able to do these three pillars uh, greatly, but they will also be able to interlink these three pillars together. So the themes will be the ones that drive the gameplay, the gameplay will facilitate the narrative freedoms, and the narrative freedoms will be what uh, goes back to the theme and the story of your role-playing game. In my opinion, a torch in the dark is one of those games. It is a game that weaves a web that link all these pillars of great solo role-playing games into a tightly designed system. Not only does it do that, but it also does it without uh, having 
a bloat system. It trimmed the fat of the three pillars and only keep it to the minimum, the essentials. To play a torch in the dark, there is no need to use a hex crawl. There's no need to do journaling. There's no dungeon mapping or even drawings. There's no tokens required to play this game. All you need is a deck of poker cards with the jokers included, uh, some D6 dice for your dice test, and a player character sheet. More, more important than that is that it doesn't require experience. That's right, this is the perfect solo role-playing game for any new players that just started in the solo role-playing experience. Um, and you don't have to be a GM. You don't have to have a brain of a novelist to play a solo role-playing game. So for those of you who have tried games like Iron Swan or Scarlet Heroes or any other GM emulators and find it too much, there's too much work that you need as a player, this is probably the game for you. So this game is written and designed by Michael Elliott from Not Playing Games. And this is a print and play game that you can find on both Drive for RPG and on, I think, uh, itch.io.com. Uh, this is a relatively short game. There is about 70 pages. Uh, it is a campaign game. So there are nine dungeons in the game itself. So you will basically play through them one by one and there will be a concrete ending to it. Uh, this game is based on the uh, Blaze in the Dark system, uh, but it is uh, heavily modified. The only thing that I can tell that is a direct link is the dice test system, where basically uh, you uses a D6 system. Uh, you can use as many as you want, depending on how much you want, uh, what kind of skills are relevant to the test. Uh, I think one to three will mean a failure, four to five will mean a mixed success, and then number six will be a kind of a critical success. So that's the main thing that is, uh, in my opinion, linked to the blades in the saw dark system. So uh, effectively, this game has a uh, relatively straightforward gameplay where you use a deck of poker cards to draw the next dungeon room that you will encounter. Then you go into the specific result. For example, if we are in this specific dungeon, you will need to go to the two of spade, where you can see the ground here is uneven, a shallow grave full of rollers they start to animate, risk it. That in turn will allow you to do some dice rolls and check on the results and then proceed to the next challenge. In that sense, it is very similar to uh, the likes of Darker Castles where the popular uh, card game uh, is basically a trimmed down dungeon crawl where you go through room by room, card by card, and just solve the encounter on the card. What is different is this game creates a great sense of narrative, and also it allows the players to interpret the situation in any way they want, but it will still fall back to this tightly designed system. So instead of going through all the uh, system, the gameplay rules individually, I am instead going to start directly with the gameplay sections because I think this game will self-explain itself pretty easily. Uh, and more importantly, I think that is where we can show how this game weaves those three pillars that I mentioned earlier, the theme, 
the gameplay and also the narrative freedom together to create a solo role-playing experience that is not like any other that I've experienced before. So let's go straight into the gameplay. The Vault of Viscount Allard Hunt The Viscount was in charge of wheat production for Kinberg. He oversaw the hundreds of farmers who the nobility taxed and promised protection. The official story is that he died of exhaustion ploughing the fields, but we all knew that man never worked a plough, never set foot on farm, not unless it was to berate his workers or to cigarette weight his best farmers. His soul was probably claimed by the demons the highborn consorted with, though I also heard a rumour that he died on a commode. He had a habit of forcing his best farmers to be buried in his fort, and sometimes he wouldn't even wait until they were dead. The Viscount hated the idea that other lords would steal them away and profit from their labour. After the revolution, many people have attempted to delve into the vault, seeking the remains of the families and some personal recompense from this dreadful landowner. Expect a lot of undead, other desperate delvers, and traps fashioned from farming equipment. Go, kill Viscount Ollard Hunt. So, in the interest of time, I have already set up a character. I have decided to use the uh, default example characters, Alfron, the Demon Hunter, and I have already set up the uh, character sheet, as you can see over here. We have three main skills, Brawling, Dueling, and Athletics. And in our infantry, we have a sword, we have an armor that is with three loads, so three grit, and we have a holy symbol and a torch, uh, three torches. So let's start with our first dungeon, the Vault of Viscount Alad Hunt. And I'm going to start by pulling the very first card. So this is a two of spade, if you believe it. Uh, so let's go to the two of spade. So at the start of our dungeon, uh, we just walked in and uh, we discovered that the ground here is uneven. A shallow grave full of royalists and they start to animate, risk it. So straight away, in my opinion, I think uh, we just walk into this fort. Uh, we probably dig a little tunnel, tunnel um, it's just for ourselves and we get into a little tomb and uh, there are some um, some dead people there that started to notice us and started to animate and we have to risk it. Uh, looking at our skills we have brawling, dueling and uh, athletics so we are going to uh, use the uh, brawling and also our sword and our armor. In that sense, basically, we are just going to fight this group of uh, undead royalists. And I am going to roll the dice. As I mentioned, we are going to use three skills. So we're going to get three dice. So let's see what we're going to get. So we get one and four which means that we have a partial success and in that sense we're going to take the consequence of um, expensing an item and I would say the item that we're expensing will be the armor. So basically uh, we fight these undead royalists uh, and it turns out they are more problematic than we initially uh, expected. Even though we are good at brawling, they still bite, um, you know, or, or bite into our armors and uh, strip some of the, uh, the the plate off. So our armor is slightly damaged, uh, which is not good because that's just the very first encounter. So let's go to the second one. Oh, another spade of ace. Let's see what it is. A broken wooden door leads to a small room. One of the Viscount's son was buried here. 
Now his discreet, undead form shuffles around the tomb. He is adorned with several pieces of golden jewelry. Risk it and gain one treasure. Okay, so we get into another room. And then we see this、uh, Viscount son who was buried here. I wonder if his son was、uh, was only recently、um, killed because we didn't actually it,、uh, the story didn't tell us when this Viscount was dead. Was it a long time before the revolution or just before the revolution? I would just say that this is probably、uh, just. Before the revolution, so his son is probably one of those that are killed during the revolutions,、um, and in that form,、uh, we will be able to say that um, uh, he's still uh, still relatively flesh. So、uh, what we're gonna do is、uh, we can fight him. Uh, although、uh, that's probably the best thing to do, but I'm actually not going to do that because I'm going to try to use the holy symbol itself to put this thing to rest. So instead of having multiple、um, uh, multiple skills, I'm just going to bring up this holy symbol, and I'm going to see what we are going to need to get. A two crap. So.、Uh, In that sense, it's、uh, it's a good time to check what consequences we have to pay、uh, when we failed a task, and、uh, in in that case, I think we will have to mark a condition, lose an item, or mark a corruption.、Uh, I am going to first get myself one experience because I failed, so I get one experience. And、um, I'm gonna say I'm gonna get a condition. Conditions, as you can see here, there will be、uh, quite a lot that we can pick from.、Uh, I am going to say the situation is uh, during uh, our kind of ex,、uh, using the the holy symbol to calm the Viscount Sun.、Uh, we get closer. He seems to be pacified, but at the moment we、we'll、try to grab those、uh, gold jewels that is on the、uh, on the on the body.、Um, the the viscount son suddenly grab us、uh, by the、um, by our, by the hand and uh, start uh, biting us. So、uh, we obviously try to、uh, get away. Um, we we don't know why it happened, but apparently it probably is because something that is、uh, related to gold jewelry is probably a、uh, a ward that、um, that is meant to keep him uh, uh, stable. But we I would say that I am actually terrified in that sense. So I have I'm gonna terrified myself from.、Uh, Trying to grab a gold jewelry from a dead body. So that's the first condition that we have. We can have up to three、uh, because we already have three skills,、um, but、uh, it's not great. So、uh, we need to be careful. So let's go to the next、mm, encounter, the next room, if you like. Oh, another spade. So、uh, we do have quite a lot of spades. What we see: a group of animated skeletons tumbles into the view. So、uh, after we get away from the、uh, Viscount Sun,、um, actually I need to、uh, gain a treasure because even though we、uh, failed, we should be able to gain the treasure as this.、Um, I would say that、um, we stumbled into the corridor, and、uh, that is where the Viscount、uh, buried a few gods for the、uh, for their sons,、uh, and、uh, that those gods will be the animated skeletons. And I would assume that these skeletons are 
going to be equipped with some uh, some kind of armors or um, or weapons, even though they might be rusted, uh, which means that we can't use them, but uh, they will do harm to us. So we are going to have to fight them, I guess. We have our sword, we have our armor, um, we have our boring skills, so we are just going to do that. So three dice, let's see how it goes. Okay, partial success because we have got a five here. So again, we get past this uh, um, encounter. Uh, we didn't gain any experience. Uh, but we have to pay some kind of uh, consequences, although this time, because it is a partial success, we can choose from a number of options instead of having two options, multiple options here. We can mark a condition, we can expand an item, we can lose an item, we can mark one stress, mark one corruption, or harm in a, uh, a companion, which we don't have. So we are, in that case, I think, uh, because it's going to be a fighting scene, so these uh, skeletons are fighting me. Um, I would say that uh, we partially success in uh, expands a the armor. So again, more damage to our to our armor, which brings it down to one grit. So initially it was three, now it's down to one. So let's go to the next step. Let's see what we're going to get. A five of hearts. So let's go to the five of hearts. Okay, there we go. You find a delver. He's screaming at demons that you cannot see. Risk it. Okay, so uh, there's a... after getting through these skeletons, uh, we get to another room. We see this delver there. So a fellow delver. And uh, he seems to be mad already, so he can't be reasoned with. He's just screaming at demons that you cannot see. So um, even though the room seems empty, suddenly we feel a, um, a, uh, a shivering. So there is something that you cannot see. And uh, unfortunately, our character is really bad at doing anything related to supernatural stuff even though we are demon hunter you know if we can't use uh, brute force then, uh, then we can't do too much stuff so um, I'm gonna say that our character is going to use his holy symbol to uh, to basically hold on to that and uh, probably say demon show yourself and so forth so let's see how that goes I'm gonna just roll one die so a four Okay, that is partially success. So the holy symbol works actually. So the demons showed themselves and uh, they, because of the holy symbol, they are not going to uh, get to us. Uh, they are going to uh, stay at a specific length. They won't be attacking us directly, uh, but we have to still pay a price corruption so i would say we have a bit of stress because we're dealing with things that we uh, we normally don't know how to deal with it is things that we don't normally know and you know, we're not good at supernatural stuff so that is that so we managed to uh to actually get out of the room before the uh the demons get used to the holy symbol Unfortunately, that means that we're leaving the, uh, the crazy Delver, um, the Delver that loses their mind in that room. That's unfortunately, and that's probably what causes the stress to our character. So let's go to the next room. Number eight. Eight of spade. So you find an undead baron feasting on a dead Delver. Risk it. Oh no, so this is probably the companion of the previous mad delver that we uh, noticed. So, straight out of the uh, uh, the, the frying, frying pan, straight into the fire, I guess. Um, so, um, that is a good thing because it says you find 
and undead baron. So there's just one person or one monster there. And in fact, we are actually good at dueling. So I'm going to use dueling and we're going to use our sword and we're going to use our armor as well. So we will use three dice in this case and we'll see how uh, how well we do. Can we get rid of the, uh, the undead baron? Okay, five, one, four. So we are again partially success. So we basically fight this uh, undead baron. Uh, he probably just throw that dead delver around because there's uh, fresher meat, uh, which is us. So we are gonna fight it. And um, yes, we successfully, after the long fight, uh, managed to take uh, take down the the undead baron, put it to rest forever. Um, but in the in the in the in the same time, we have to pay a price. And I'm gonna say, we well, I'm gonna take the corruption in this case because during our fight, we are influenced by the undead baron. There is some demon force behind the uh, reanimation, obviously. So part of what reanimated the Baron were transferred to us and uh, that means corruption that's not good but let's go on so the next one will be two of hearts so let's see what we have two peasants have found a way in and are pecking over a noble's remains they won't let you pass risk it Okay, so two peasants. I mean, we are a demon hunter and we worked for the revolution. So in that sense, I don't think we can just um, take these uh, peasants down, I guess. Uh, we're not good at any kind of um, conversational skills. We're not very good at that. Um, so we are going to just try to brawl with these guys, I guess, without our sword. So just one skill, and uh, we'll see how it goes. So again, we will need to do run die, um, and see what we get. A three, so a failed. So how I'm gonna interpret it is that the two guys, um, they're gonna fight us over the remains, and uh, even though we successfully uh, punch them to submissions. What we didn't know is that uh, they are those so desperate, so they actually pulls out a little life knife and uh, stuck it into our um, stomach. Luckily, because of our armor, we will be able to survive. But in that sense, um, we were not prepared, so. Uh, I would say we will lose the armor, basically, in that sense, because we only have one one grid left, so we don't have any, any armor on us now. <clears throat> okay, so next, let's see what we get. We managed to get out of that room, uh, even though um, and leave those two peasants with the, 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 the dead bodies. So we didn't gain any treasures, but in this case, we will get into another room with loyalist ones camped out in this section of the vault, hiding from the re revolution. Now their bodies litter the stone floor. Risk it to find one treasures among their bodies. Okay, so uh, I don't think we have any specific skills in place. Um, we just basically get into a room. We see loads of bodies on the on the floor. We don't know what killed them. Funny enough, so uh, it didn't say so. So uh, could it be starvation? Could it be I don't know, flooding, gassing, uh, fire, whatever it is. We don't know. So this is just a, a bunch of body on the floor. Um, so we're gonna risk it. We're gonna be try to be as careful as we can. But this is actually a good time to uh, talk about what happens if you don't have any skills in place to use. Um, and basically in that case, you will have to roll uh, two 
uh, dice and uh, you will need to find the uh, you will need to use the lower of the two dice when you don't have any skills at all so we're gonna roll that oh the botched one so let's do it again oh that's clear so one so we completely failed it um, and we failed it because we don't know what killed these uh, royalists in the first place and uh, I would say it turns out it is actually a trap that the Viscount Alatund originally have his uh, tomb builders to put in because he was afraid uh, people will uh, stole from his tomb and um, and these royalists actually came into the wrong place and the wrong time and uh, there's lots of traps coming out uh, from the uh, from the wars and uh, as the uh, as the introduction suggested this will be traps fashioned from farming equipment so uh, probably a lot of uh, uh, scythe, scythe coming out from the uh, uh, from the uh, from the wars that is um, gonna cut everything into pieces uh, in the room. So uh, we do have um, we we are quite uh, uh, athletics. So um, I would say we probably will not die straight away, but the gameplay won't allow us to die straight away because the consequences. There's a condition: uh, lose an item or a corruption. So. I'm gonna say this is gonna be a uh, condition because it's clearly that we are in such a physical danger that um, I would say we are slash. So although it didn't cut our heads off, we are we are, we are badly wounded. Uh, so we are slashed now. So we're terrified and we are slashed. That's not great, um, and we don't even have an, uh, the the armor anymore. So, uh, so that probably contributes to uh, us being uh, slashed by these traps straight away. So let's go to the next room. The six of diamonds, and uh, okay. So, so we pulled ourselves up. Oh, and that's interesting. Rusted rakes shovels and pitchforks swing out at you from the walls risk it so i would say we're still in the same room after the first wave of the traps uh we we are being badly slashed so we are wounded but we are um ready for the second wave basically when the second wave of uh, traps starts swinging at us so this time I'm going to use the athletic skills which we have um, and we'll see if we are able to dodge this, uh, these uh, kind of uh, traps because now we can see them. So let's try this. No, a fail. <laughs> so we gained three experience though. So that's an excellent thing because that means we can straight away learn another skill which will be very important if we are to survive this situation because we cannot gain as many a condition as we have in terms of skill. So we have to learn the skill first uh, before we take the condition, if we are going to take the condition. So what skills are we going to learn? Um, I think during our very short experience in the uh, in the dungeon which we have actually only gone through i don't know how many one two three four five six seven eight eight cots one thing we learned is that we have to be um we have to be more uh tactical uh, and the reason is that because we have to plan prank and outwit enemies. So one thing we have done so far is we've just uh, rushed into a room and find us ourselves either surrounded by a group of peasants or uh, you know undead, animated undead, which uh, which we're not 
put ourselves in a good situation. So I am going to say we are going to learn to be more tactical. I am going to remove all the XP's that we have learned so far. So the next time we need to learn, we need to gain four XP's before we can uh, gain a skill. But as I mentioned, we have to pay a price uh, because we tried to dodge the second wave, which um, we have to pay a price because we failed to roll. And I would say we failed that by actually we managed to um, to dodge it. But during that same period, we have to lose one item. And I would say it's a torch. Basically, we jumped out of the room. Uh, and we have to um, use the torch, leave the torch that we were holding previously uh, on the floor because uh, we can't simply go back to that room. There's too many traps there. Okay, so that's uh, solved the situation. So let's go to the next room. Five of diamonds. Arrows shoot out from the walls. Oh god damn it, there's so many traps in this goddamn place. So uh just straight out of the room, we are in the in the corridor and uh there are more more arrows coming in and we see basically where it's going because the Viscount uh Arlot Hunt is uh obviously uh kind of having these kind of um uh pleasures of torturing the Tomb Raiders uh, so he set up waves of traps and then when you think that you are in a safe place and when you get out of the trap room there's more traps waiting for you so that's what, what they do so um, this time I don't think we can use the tactics just yet so we'll probably just use the uh, athletics skills just to um, see how quickly we can react to the situation and uh, that's why we're going to just roll one die and uh, we'll see how it goes five partial success finally so we didn't get in any skills but i would say we jumped out of the way um uh we f we i would say we gained one stress so that's a close call because we thought that we, we are safe from the room, from the trap rooms. In terms of there's more traps and uh, we gained a bit of, uh, we're, we're getting more stressful in that situation. So next. So this is Jack of Hearts. A thief named Tori stumbled into you. You may risk it to gain them as a companion for the rest of this delve. Okay, so we finally get out of that uh, corridor. And funny enough, there's another person there sitting just right there, probably also resting a bit after getting out of other trap rooms. And uh, his name is Tom, sorry, Tori. So we don't have any speech skills. So I guess we'll still try to uh, Try to convince him, saying that you know we are now quite deep into the into the vault. Um, as you can see, there's so many traps around. Uh, if we are not going to work together, then um, then we would both die. Um, if we work together, we will have to share the treasure. But at the same time, um, there's less likely that um, that we'll die. So I don't have any skills. So I'm just going to roll two dice and see the, the lesser as the result. Okay, failed. So I think what it means is straightforward that um, the thief will join us, but he will need some upfront payment. And uh, luckily we have treasures with us. So I am going to... Uh, Remove the treasure that we gained previously, and we we're gonna gain Tori, the thief, as the uh, as, as the companion. Okay. So, let's go to the next spot. 
that is going to be a eighth of club. So you hear diabolic words. You feel ghostly flames around you. Risk it. Oh, so while we're talking, the temperature of the room that we are in suddenly uh, drops. So we feel the uh, the forks coming out of our mouth when we start talking, and we start hearing voices. And uh, you feel ghostly frames uh, around us. Uh, I mean. Again, we're not good at. Uh, sorry, actually, we need to gain an experience from um, uh, convincing Tori to leave the thief to become our companion. So we paid him the treasure, but we learn a bit about how to deal with people. So that's the experience. So I don't think that's anything we can do. Uh, we are really bad at dealing with supernatural forces. So we will just uh, say, talk, tell. Uh, Tori that we have to run for it. We need to get out of here right here right now um, And we just run for our lives. So um, in that sense um, I'm going to use the two dice see which was the uh, lower one. Oh That's great partial success. So uh, So we can't use the six obviously because uh, that will be too good Um so we have to run out of the room, and during that process, I would say um, the although there's these ghostly flames, they're actually really freezing temperatures. So instead of having a, a, a being hot, they are really cold. So we have to lose one more torch, I would say, because it blows the uh, the the short uh, the torch that we we were holding, and it freezes it. So finally, we we run to a place where there's no longer these um, ghostly flames, and uh, we will be seeing what we see next. Eight of diamonds. So massive steel since cut at you from the walls. Risk it. Oh, more of this stuff. Oh man. Okay. So. Um, we have to keep our torch, so we can't have no torches because if there's that's that's the point of the game, a torch in the dark. If you don't have any torches, you will be um, swallowed by the darkness. So you have to keep one torch. Um, I would say in this case, uh, I mean, Tori the thief is not really useful, isn't he? It's not going to be able to do much. I mean, there is a chance because I would say I want to risk Tori the thief in this case. I'm going to say he that when the uh, when this mass massive sim, uh, sims start cutting at us, Tori the thief is the more experienced person regarding two traps, so he helped. Uh, called out saying that look there are these sins coming out be careful and uh, in that case it buys us just enough time to be uh, to, to start to uh, dodge these uh, these traps and that's why I'm going to use both Tori and Athletics as the skill check and see how it goes oh can't really see the result so five and a one. So we are partially success in that sense. And um, and in that case, I would say because Tori uh, told us in time and we success in that sense. So uh, we just basically become more stressful. So just too many goddamn traps in this place. Okay, so jack of clubs so let's see the two morphi count alatron is full of painted frescoes and statues imitating the wheat farmers 
who suffered under him for years. Many of his farmers are entombed with here with him, along with what remained of his personal bodyguards. His elaborate uh, scrapages slowly opens. Risk it three times. After three success, you find three treasures and、um, complete the goal of this dungeon. Oh, that's great! So we get to the、uh, the final room. So we have to risk it three times, though.、Um, and after three success, you will find three treasures. So I don't know. We will have to do it. We have to do something. So、uh, luckily. This is probably just one person. I'm gonna interpret it as just one viscount. So we will have to be able to we we will be able to use the dueling skills, our swords. I'm gonna hold my holy symbol on the other hand,、uh, and、uh, hopefully that's gonna do something.、Uh, maybe slow down the viscount.、Uh, uh, or or actually, sorry. I can't actually use dueling because it says that there are many farmers entombed here with him, along with what remained of his personal bodyguards. Okay, so that's so I actually cannot use、um, dueling, but I can use tactics because I am going to、uh, try to、uh, fight them one at a time. So we're actually going to、uh, with Tori the Thief. Uh, we're gonna stand at one corner, and we're gonna fight them one at a time. So we don't fight all of them together, and、I、consider that a use of tactics, and our sword, and our holy symbol. So we still have three,、uh, three dice, and let's see how it goes. Okay, first is a success because we get a six. So we defeated some. Of the,、uh, we basically defeated all these farmers. They're the easiest to deal with, I would say. The first ones to rush over, or if I can, order them to to、uh, to overrun us. But we、uh, succeeded in、uh, defeating ourselves. So the second one is four, which is a partial success. So they come over here. They actually, I'm going to say, Tory, take a take a hit、uh, for me. So I'm gonna get him one harm,、um, and then we still successfully、uh, defeated the bodyguard. So after fighting, slashing, and so forth,、uh, we get rid of all the,、uh, the bodyguards. And the last bit will obviously be Viscount himself. So in that sense, actually, we will be able to use Juni now because. We successfully in、um, dealing with the、um, the bodyguards and the farmers, so we are down to one on one.、Uh, and Tori is、uh, is going to be helpless from from the side, so、uh, we will be able to use four skills. And、uh, let's see how it goes. Yay! And that's a success. So that is. Absolutely amazing. That means that we finally、uh, destroyed the Viscount、uh, Alatunt in his fort, and、uh, we are successful in our first mission, in our first dungeon, and we get out alive. Now I do need to check if I have to、um, pay the、uh, companion. Oh, actually. We already paid him up front, so、uh, he's not going to take anything from us. So、uh, he's hurt,、uh, but he's going to leave us because he is going to、um, uh, find the next、uh, place to to delve, I guess, to to find the next tomb to raid. So we beat our goodbyes with Tory the thief. So he's gone. Okay. And we are now leave with three treasures. That is perfect. It's basically the first part of the、uh, game that is torch in the dark, and that is the delve part. So we successfully、uh, completed in the first mission.、Uh, as you can see, we actually have gone through quite a few cards.、Uh, now this is one of those games that is randomized, so. 
in a really bad situation, you will have to go through the full decks before you find the final uh, mission deck, which is the uh, the spade. Sorry, the, uh, the clops of the, the jack of clops in this case. Uh, but we are pretty lucky that we we still have a, a, a huge deck to go. So we we actually managed to find the uh, the mission deck uh, just by going through maybe just a small part of the whole deck. But as you can see, this game is great in a few things. First of all, the themes is excellent. So the prompts are written in a way that it provides not only, um, just say, uh, a, a situation, but that situation is fitting to the story, to the themes. You're fighting royalists, you're fighting with uh, actually other Delvers, so could be other revolutionists, uh, your compatriots, they are people that you know or you are supposed to be together, but because of the situation, because you're fighting for the same treasures, you have to fight each other. Um, and that is the story that that kind of prompts is so important for solo role players because that helps you create a story that is believable. The second part is obviously the use of infantry, as you can see. So we started obviously with the um, with the armor, with uh, a lot of torches. We're down to one single torches. So it it creates the story simply by having this three times five grids. We are down to our very last torches. If we are to fail something else. Uh, or we are in a situation where we have to interpret it as that we will lose a torch, then we will be gone. We will be lost forever in this five counts uh, vault. Um, and how often will you get into that kind of situation in any other role playing games where you have you know a twenty uh, uh, gear slot? When will you ever use down to your last torch? Or when will you have to be so um, so careful with your infantry or with what you bring with yourself? Um, you don't really do that. And that is why this game is excellent. Because the gameplay mechanism, the tracking of these stats, is the main tool that pushes the narrative. And your narrative will, again, come back into uh, creating stories and the stories will allow you to drive the gameplay forward. So that is essentially how to play a torch in the dark and um, I would say anyone should try this. This is a game so unknown that if you type this game on uh, on YouTube you won't find any other let's play or review videos. Uh, this is probably the first one uh, that you will find. Uh, this is not the cheapest game, I think. It is about $15 on HIO and uh, Drive for RPG, but there's constantly sales, um, so they will drop down to about $7. Uh, and I'm not ashamed to say that I actually claim this as a community copy in the first place. This game is so unknown, but so great, that there are more than 100 community copies sitting in HIO. So, you know, if you can't afford it, I would say, you know, try it out. There's no harm. Um, and I hope that this will be useful for anyone who are intimidated when they first try any solo role-playing games because they're just too hard. I mean, you have to be a GM uh, you have to think like a GM in the first place in order to play solo role playing games in the majority of the time when you play Iron Swan, Scarlet Hero and so forth. But in the torch in the dark, you do not need that. You just need this book. You just need a pack of cards, some dice, pen and paper, and you're ready to go. And it allows you to practice your narrative skills in a gamified uh, experience. So you will get more ready when you get into the real deal, the real narrative, the open-ended ended, um, solo role-playing games that you initially wanted to play, but find them too difficult to, to start. Okay, 
So that is it. Uh, thank you for watching. I will talk to you next time. Thank you. Bye bye.